Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, blessed Easter season to all. Um, welcome to the fourth in our series of Echo Spirituality and Act of our Lunch and Learn series. My name is Sandra, and I am part of the planning committee. I'd like to start with a prayer this afternoon. The prayer is from Ed Hayes, and it's called Blessing Prayer for a Garden. Lord of creation, who planted your own garden called Eden, come and bless our soil, which is to be our garden. All that dies becomes earth, and so it lives again. May this garden soil be both womb and tomb, a home for death and life, so that seeds of living things, of plants, of food and flowers may die and resurrect here in our garden. Ancient earth, our mystical mother, teach us your children that all things die to nourish life. Gentle earth, be blessed with our love as we work in you. Make us mindful that one day you will be our final bed of love and ecstasy. Amen. Amen. And now I'd like to introduce Beth Piggish, the FSPA Integral Ecology Director, who would like to share some information with you next. Beth? Thanks, Sandra. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am very excited to present to you the um, next speaker, which is Karen Stoltz. Karen and I have had uh, the good fortune of working together for almost two years now, almost to the date. And um, she is our Eco Spirituality Project Outreach Coordinator with FSPA. And Karen and myself and Steve DeWald, our Land Sustainability Coordinator, we are all part of a team to help care for the FSPA land on St. Joseph Ridge. So as we get started, I'd like to recognize that we are talking about growing and caring for land that is a traditional Ho-Chunk space um, and just to respect all indigenous cultures as we, we go forward and figure out how we can do this together for future generations. Karen has a really dynamic um, background. She has been instrumental in bringing volunteers, collegiate volunteers, school groups, garden groups out to the garden on FSPA land, which is behind the villa building. She is um, just a joy to work with. So we're really happy that she's able to share her knowledge with us. She's going to give us a little bit of a tour of Jacoba's greenhouse. Um, I'm going to show a picture real quick, Karen, of what it looks like on the outside. And then um, she'll just kind of give us the tour and then kind of give us that gardening 101, where to start. Feel free um, to ask questions in the chat box and Karen will have some Q&A time at the end. Any question about gardening is open. Um, and then we will have a closing prayer. And then if people want to stick around after the one o'clock hour, you're welcome to and, and pick Karen's brain a little bit more about growing and getting your seeds started. All right, so Karen, I'm gonna figure out how to share the screen real quick and then I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, and that's the, that's the greenhouse, Jacoba's greenhouse as you're coming, uh, you're walking towards it and then off to the right there, uh, that's kind of what it looks like inside. That's really nice. And then, uh, Beth, can I go ahead and snag the spot? Oh, look at this. We're on top of your game. Hello, everybody. This is what I look like. I'm going to go ahead and uh, <laughs> switch over to the greenhouse so you can actually see more. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, this is what it looks like right now as, um, as you walk in. Okay. And so um, let's begin. Uh, so you can see a whole bunch of, we're using almost all of our uh, flat space in the greenhouse right now for a lot of seedlings. Um, you can see that right here, we've got some kohlrabi guys, and then we've got um, some Brussels sprouts, which is a new thing this year. Um, we've got a lot of cabbage, broccoli, um, tomatoes, peppers, 
all of that fun stuff. We're also growing a lot of um, uh, geraniums. You'll see them around here. Uh, what we're doing is we're hoping to grow enough so that the villa doesn't have to buy any anymore and we'll just have um, them available. Uh, right here, we're doing a little bit of propagation on some grapes. I'm hoping to add those to the fun. Um, so they're just starting to leaf out, which is exciting. And we've got them in a nice uh, glass. So we'll be able to see them when they root out too. So hopefully um, they actually do. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a new experiment for us, I guess. So I'm cruising around here. Here is one of the coolest plants in the entire world. I'm quite biased towards it. It's a fig. And we do have a few figs actually uh, right here. And then here's our growing medium that we've got right now, a bunch of growing medium. We do use organic. And uh, here is one of our uh, structures that we've got uh, that has a lot more of our little seedlings on and a lot of geraniums on the side. This is a recurring thing mm -hmm. in the greenhouse here. I'll try not to get you uh, sea stick as we're cruising around. I'll go kind of slowly. Um, I use this, um, this is kind of a new addition this year just to kind of sort out my seeds. So for example, what do we got? Or oregano and uh, basil in here right now. And then here's some more little basil plants, little basil seedlings, more geraniums in the windows. And uh, those geraniums actually were what we had uh, saved uh, from what the uh, villa had given us and some sisters had given us last fall. Um, they were going to pitch them out. And uh, yeah, we thought we'd save them, stick them in the cellar, bare root, and uh, yeah, um, rehydrate them again in the spring. And uh, we, took, we did take a few cuttings off of them and, uh, and um, also just get them up and running again. So this is what they're looking like um, after uh, we took the bare roots and uh, put them in some growing medium and also, uh, you know, gave them a little bit of, a uh, little bit of water. So here's our rosemary plant. I really wish you could smell this. It is just <laughs> amazing. Um, that's a very popular item here. We also have some common thyme here. Here's a Swiss chard back there. The lavender is blooming right now. It's, it also smells quite lovely. <laughs> and we just ripped out our spinach on that really um, warm week that we had last week or the week before, I think it was maybe both even. I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly. Um, our spinach has uh, gone up, it's kind of bolted. So we ripped that out. And uh, we just replanted this out. We're, <laughs> I found this crazy thing with um, a capstone student, Pat. There was some corn that said it could be transplanted. So we're trying two varieties, uh, of course, organic. One is called Enchanted and the other one is called Allure. So they both said that they could be transplanted. We're gonna see if that's true. <laughs> um, here's some lettuce. And you'll see little um, yellow sticky papers. Um, these are our pest control right here. And you'll also see some little cups down there. We've put uh, beer in them and that is to kill slugs. Uh, right over here, uh, okay. this is our broccoli. Yeah, go ahead. Just go a little slower on the camera. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, so this is our broccoli and we'll just keep on cruising. Along our window, you'll see more geraniums of various colors and uh, more broccoli, some carrots. Ooh, this broccoli's got a nice little head on it. We'll probably harvest that out this next week. Okay, we'll keep going. And I noticed in the greenhouse that um, I had never grown broccoli in a greenhouse before, but instead of big heads of broccoli, I think there's less, maybe less light or something. So you end up with a whole bunch of smaller, uh, like florets of broccoli. So broccolini almost, which is kind of fun. So then, Another flat surface, which means more seedlings. 
and then a citrus tree here right next to our far window here which has more geraniums yeah we try to we're trying to maximize our space out here okay and then you just saw the back door and then here's a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch more of our little seedlings i got some peppers up top and then what do we've got here we got some cauliflower um down here two trays of those and the bottom is another one yep so got a lot of cauliflower there some cabbage kind of see those guys and you'll see grow lights here where we can put them and then a whole bunch more broccoli brussels sprouts peppers cauliflower, kind of see the bigger guys down here. Oh, eggplant, seeing these guys right there. Yeah, so that's kind of what we've got. Here's another row of lettuce, a nice blend there. I used blend mix. Here's some more geraniums. We've got hanging up here, kind of trellis them up. And then our water hose, back door. You can kind of see our windows facing south, maximize that sun. And then these are actually the cuttings that we took off of the geraniums earlier this spring, uh, off of the bare root geraniums. And then we also had some geraniums that we kept alive uh, throughout the uh, winter. So we tried taking cuttings off of both to see how they would fare. Um, both fared pretty well, actually. So we were kind of impressed with that. And then more little baby uh, peppers there. And then this little, or this uh, raised bed here uh, has a bunch of our tomatoes. You can see that they're just starting to pop their little heads up. And we do use drip irrigation here. So you'll see those uh, drip lines in here as well. That's a big uh, black long uh, little strips there. And so, yeah, these guys were just planted last week. One thing you don't want is your tomatoes to get very, um, to get huge. You want to keep them at a reasonable size. Um, you don't want them to get super lanky, known as leggy. Um, before you have to plant them out. Okay, and this is our sink. The water that we use here is um, what we've collected from the rain gutters and such. And uh, so it's not safe for people to drink because kind of whatever has been marinating in there kind of comes up too. It does go through a light filtration as well. So here's our sink and a little bit of a drain spot. This is our workroom in here, very exciting. We have our fridge in there and all kinds of fun stuff. We have a composting toilet. It's very important, I guess, that you guys know this, I've decided. Um, and it is kind of cool. So all you do is um, we, we just kind of, I don't know, kind of compost down a little bit. We only have to clean that out about once a year, which is nice. Um, go a little back here. Uh, we do need to weigh all of our produce and uh, we log it in this book a little notebook here. And we also um, put that in a spreadsheet and that's how we keep track of our stuff. Um, we save our eggshells. Here's another batch that Pat brought in on Monday. We dry them up, crush them down, and we'll put those under our tomato plants when we transplant them outside, which is kind of cool. Um, we also do save bags. <laughs> it looks like we're doing a little bit of hoarding here, but um, yeah, we're saving those and we will use all of those you know, this year. And uh, we also um, send out orders um, on a weekly basis. Uh, every week, it's either going to um, sisters that live kind of like off campus or the dining services um either one so here is some art that sister karen capel uh had uh made and they're they're really neat and so um we're we're very lucky to have them up in the greenhouse here um so i just wanted to cruise down over here real quick and show you also 
These are our gutter gardens. They're kind of raised. You can see that they're up pretty high and we use a pulley system. Uh, that was Sister Lucy's idea. And um, uh, to my knowledge, I should say. And uh, yeah, we plant them out in microgreens and you can see they're a little, um, we have a rainbow of uh, radishes in this one currently. And it looks like they just popped up maybe yesterday. And so we'll have them ready for um, orders uh, on Thursday. So it's kind of a cute little um, blend right there. Kind of see those guys, they're just happy. Um, we also do sunflowers. Um, you'll see in pea shoots down here, get pretty close to them. And essentially what you do is you'll uh, let them grow and then cut off maybe like the top third of it and it's very tender and that's what you'll send out uh, or eat yourself <laughs> and um yeah it's it's quite lovely it tastes like peas just kind of like what you would expect I assume and uh yeah so those are pea shoots and you can get about you know like five six cuttings off of one plant which is kind of nice um these are our beet greens over here and uh, yeah, we planted these um, quite a while back. Um, I would say maybe December, um, but we've been cutting them every week. We've been trimming them, uh, using them as beet greens, baby beet greens. And uh, this last week, what we did was we thinned them out, um, meaning that we just uh, pulled a lot of them uh, to make space for the ones that we do want to keep. Um, so then we'll have space in between each of the beets so then they can actually form, uh, you know, the, you know, the typical beet that you think of, you know, the root vegetable. And uh, we've also planted out some onions. These onions are going to be the onions that will be growing outside in the garden. So they're like a, a sweet yellow onion right there. We got some red onions. Uh, that we planted out here. And in the middle, you'll see that we have some uh, little broccoli as well. Just behind me, you might've heard me rustle against it. This is uh, our navel orange and it just got done blooming, but what's kind of fun, as you can see, a lot of little baby navel oranges. Right there is an example of one. <laughs> but it's not super gorgeous right now, but it's just nice to see those uh, that they're all forming. Um, a lot of them will drop and it'll just focus in on probably a few uh, later on. So you'll see more lettuce uh, towards the end of this row. Cruise on down here. Got some lettuce and uh, we've got some parsley. And we've got a whole bunch of spring onions uh, that we're growing. Those will go into the dining services. And this is my workstation that we got right now that we'll be uh, using for the rest of the presentation. But I'm gonna transfer over to my laptop now. So I'll just cut out for a little bit here and I'll meet you in just a little bit. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm going to post in the chat for everyone, we have an older um, article that was written by Sister Lucy Slinger regarding the original opening and blessing of Jacoba's greenhouse. Um, it's, it's a great article. There's a lot of good stories in um, the Presence magazine of FSPA. So if you're not familiar, you can go back and see a few of the past articles um, in the spring of 2020. So this time last year. We also had um, quite a few articles just regarding eco-spirituality and our project here with the Lunch and Learn series is just a continuation of, um, you know, that charism and, and trying to help folks connect with topics of interest and, and how they can do something at home. So when Karen is ready, she's going to walk us through, I got to find you on the screen, there you are, um, walk us through some uh, Gardening 101. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Beth. Uh, so welcome back. Um, so just thinking about gardening right now uh, is the time to get started on that. So um, if you are 
you know, if you're, if you are just starting from zero right now, you're going to want to kick it into high gear, really start thinking about what you want to grow because, um, what you want to allow yourself for is, um, if you want to start your plants indoors, you need to be doing that right now. Um, most plants need to be, uh, six to eight weeks before the last frost date. That's when you want to start them. Um, some are more. So for example, like those onions, uh, you wanted to start those optimally in like, say, February. Uh, they take a little bit longer. Um, if you wanted to start petunias, that's also like, you know, maybe even January would have been a good time for those type of plants. Um, but for most garden vegetables, six to eight weeks, um, like right now, um, or actually a little in, you know, a little earlier, even in like March, uh, after St. Patrick's Day is usually a good time to get started for most uh, garden produce. Um, but uh, it's better, it seems to me, based off of my experience, it seems better almost to plant a smaller plant than one that's gotten way too lanky, that's way too big. So um, for the most part, this is, uh, it, it isn't too late, especially like if you're thinking about other plants that go, you know, seed directly into the ground, um, this is a good time to be planting that. So, so for example, what would you plant in the ground versus what would you start early? Um, a lot of our, our experienced gardeners, I'm sure would be able to give me a whole lesson on that, but just for, you know, just for fun, uh, I'm just going to share a few examples. Uh, what you would want to start early are a lot of your plants, like your, um, say like your broccoli, your cauliflower, your tomatoes, your peppers, a lot of long season plants uh, will need to be started early. Um, plants that you don't want to start early um, are, you know, inside are like say potatoes or a lot of root, um, a lot of root crops that have tap roots, you know, a lot of um, plants that don't tend to um, uh, you know, they don't tend to transplant well. Um, and so, for example, or, or also plants that are short season. So for example, um, you saw how we were kind of using up all of our flat space uh, for our seedlings. Um, you don't really wanna be putting lettuce um, that has a very short life, uh, you know, uh, days, of days to maturity, uh, days till it's ready to produce. Um, you don't wanna spend that space on a plant like lettuce inside, unless you've got a ton of space, you know, then go for it. Um, it will transplant well, um, but it, it's just kind of a waste of space uh, if you're trying to maximize that. So like lettuce, spinach, that type of thing, I wouldn't start that early. I also wouldn't start things like I said, you know, things that you want to start directly outside, you know, root crops, like potatoes, that type of thing. Um, prior till <laughs> this week, I thought that no corn would need to, you know, should be started inside. Um, that is general knowledge that you don't start corn inside. Well, I guess there are exceptions to every rule. Um, but uh, so that we just found the exception just this week. It took me 35 years to discover that one. Um, so that's fun. Um, but, you know, that's the cool thing about gardening. You can always learn more. Um, so those are some plants that, you know, you don't want to start inside. Um, but otherwise, uh, read the packet. That'll help you out a lot. You know, read the seed packet. It'll tell you days to maturity. It'll tell you when to plant, the depth, um, you know, like how much sun it needs. Most garden plants need full sun. Um, it'll say it right on the packet. Read your packet. That's going to give you a ton of information um, if you're starting out. And um, it'll even tell you a lot of times if you can start it early inside. Um, so that's a really um, good thing to know. So um, let's get started here um, with uh, plants that we are starting early. So um, it's not too late for uh, for some of them, we'll just uh, transplant them out. I'm just doing a little demo on red acre cabbage. Um, you know, optimally, I would have started it early, uh, you know, out, um, inside a little earlier. Um, but um, yeah, so planting time, it does say is April uh, through January or through June. What am I thinking? Sorry, I didn't read it right. April through June is when you can actually plant these outside. So if I would have had these started earlier, um, little seedlings, um, and I would have had a cover for them, I could um, be starting them outside 
um, right now based off of this map that you can see. And a lot of this is based off of like zones and like last frost date. Um, our last frost date tends to be right around uh, May 10th. And so when you go to, uh, well, I should say here, like in La Crosse area. So um, if you're, um, if you might be joining us from another area, you'll need to check your frost date. Um, but yeah, that's that's something to note. Know your last frost date, and then you can tell when you can start planting up because this is a really hardy plant. Um, it's a cold crop, and so uh, when you're selecting seeds, you know you know determine what do you want to grow. Um, what do you want? You know, what do you want to harvest? What do you want to look at? What do you want to enjoy eating? Um, how much space do you have? That'll all help you with determining what to buy. Another thing to note is make sure you're choosing a reputable source. Um, make sure that, you know, if you're getting your seeds from your friends, you know, um, make sure that they know not to be collecting uh, seeds that have had, say, like a mosaic virus or something like that. Um, that's very important that you're not spreading that because you wouldn't want to put all the work into your plants and then find out later on that you're going to lose it due to a virus that might have been, um, you know, prevent some, you know, this is something that would have been preventable. Um, so make sure you're choosing from a reputable, uh, reputable um, um, uh, friend or um, seed dealer. Also, um, I'm just using organic here, um, organic seed. This, you know, lots of uh, places around here uh, sell organic seeds. I haven't had an issue sourcing organic. Um, certain types of plants, like say red cabbage, this is harder to source locally, but you can always go to like Johnny Seeds or, you know, use an online catalog, which is kind of nice as well. So um, there are lots of good options, um, but a lot of places around here that sell um, seeds say that you're just um, interested in the La Crosse area, you know, Menards, um, Walmart, um, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, I know that there are some smaller nurseries that I, um, I haven't really gone through yet. Um, I think that also um, Ace Hardware does sell it as well. Um, and if you can get bulk, uh, that's how you can get uh, more reasonable, more reasonably priced seeds. Um, I get a lot of my seeds from the Viroqua Food Co-op and um, also from the, the People's Food Co-op have some good options as well, but I really find that I get the best options from the Viroqua Food Co-op um, for like organic seed potatoes and all of that as well. Um, they have a really nice selection of like growing media, mediums as well. So seeds, reputable source, lots of good options there. Um, next thing you're gonna need is a good growing medium. So for starting your seeds, actually starting with a seed starting mix that is different from um, say like a regular growing medium, uh, because your regular growing medium might have like larger bits to it, say um, it, it depends, like you might end up with like sticks inside of here, whereas, uh, you know, lar larger bits in there. Um, and these, the regular growing medium will almost, almost all good varieties will have some good nutrients in there. Starting mixes don't necessarily always have nutrients in there. Um, so that's something to note. Um, so this one specifically was kind of neat because this is made with coconut core, like C-O-I-R. And so it's a more sustainable option as opposed to um, the sphagnum peat moss that is uh, prevalent in a lot of the other growing mediums, which is not nearly as sustainable as an option. It's not a sustainable option. Um, so that's what it looks like. But it is uh, um, really nice to work with. Um, the only issue is coconut core is it doesn't um, retain nutrients well. Um, so that's a drawback on that. So maybe a blend is a good option. But what you want is your little seedlings to be able to get their roots through the growing medium. It needs to drain well. It needs to be able to also um, hold, um, hold some moisture as well. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, this is a good option for us. I've been trying a whole bunch of different varieties. So what else you're going to need is you're going to need um, a tray with a lot of cells in it. Um, each of these little holes is a cell. 
And you'll also need um, a tr uh, each of these uh, cells, they have holes in the bottom for the water to drain. So you'll also need a tray at the bottom of that. And you'll also, um, option, you know, it's optional. You can also get a humidity dome. A lot of, um, a lot of like, kits will have all three options together. So you put the, um, the tray that doesn't have any slots in the bottom at the very uh, base, you'll put your seed, uh, your cells uh, tray on top. And then I'm just setting my humidity dome off to the side for right now. And then what you're gonna do is go ahead and grab a hold of a lot of your uh, seed starting mix. And you'll go ahead and fill each of your cells about just over three quarters of the way full. Almost all the way full, about three quarters of the way. Can you see, you can't see me, sorry. There we go. Yeah, just kind of fill it up. Well, three quarters of the way full, just a little bit more than that, just under full. So I'm gonna do this and I did fill my tray um, <laughs> about, I filled about half of it. So then you wouldn't have to spend a ton of time watching me fill these trays as exciting as it truly is. Um, Karen, and while you're doing that, I just want to let everyone know, I'm going to try and post some links to supporting information. So I posted Johnny's seeds, seed savers, Fedco seed for everyone in the chat box. And then Great. there's also um, kind of DIY alternatives that people can use. If you don't have a nice fancy seed starting tray, I'll try and post some of those um, links as well. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like if you wanted to even use like Tupperware that's clean, make sure it's, you know, you poke holes in the bottom. You can use a lot of different options. That's a good point, Beth. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so it doesn't need to be perfect. So don't, you know, don't stress about this. So we've got ours and the others have been magically filled already, pre-filled for us. And so we're going to do is then you can kind of see, I don't know if you can see, um, you can see our growing medium in our um, tray here. And then the next thing we're gonna do is open up our seed packet. And this is, like I said, um, red acre cabbage. And um, I'll show you the seeds here. I got this one from, I think it's Home Depot. You can see how small the seeds are. They're very small. And you can buy pelleted seeds. Um, so if you have like say a Lysiantha seed, which is super teeny tiny. Um, I know they're my favorite plant, my <laughs> herbaceous plant. Um, so anyway, um, you can get them pelleted too. So if it's harder to like grab onto them, um, you can, you know, this will allow bigger seeds that way um, if they're pelleted, which means that there's a coating on the outside. Um, there are also some tools that you can use to help you plant. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use my fingers and I'm going to grab um, the seeds and I'm going to put in about three seeds in each of my cells here. And with your seeds, um, you don't want to be holding on to, you know, you can save seeds year to year, which is great, but you don't want to save um, some seeds. They'll um, germinate at a much lower rate after just a few years, whereas some other seeds, they can, um, you know, last in storage for quite a while. So for example, um, like green beans, they tend to last, you know, for quite a while. Whereas like onion seeds, I don't keep them more than a year because they don't tend to germinate well. And I have had issues with like cabbage, um, you know, getting their germination rates high um, with save seeds too. So um, that's something to note, um, you know, for, for you if, if you're just starting out. And, you know, other gardeners I'm sure have their own uh, stories for their different um, types of plants that, you know, they'll only buy new versus, um, I mean, um, save from one year versus um, being able to save them for multiple years.
Okay, so what we're gonna do now is cover the seeds. And when you're thinking about your seeds, what you want to do is you wanna cover them to three times, two to three times the width of the seed. That's the general rule for how much um, you, uh, how, how deep you should plant them. Um, so how, in this case, how much you should cover them. So um, they're pretty small. And so we just give them a general eyeballing of two to three times the width of the seed, which pretty much just <laughs> means um, cover it to the top because we filled it about three quarters the way full. And that would mean, you know, that by adding enough of this um, growing or uh, starting mix, growing medium at the top, that would, that would cover that properly. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and do that rather quickly here. And like I said, it doesn't need to be perfect, um, but some plants, they do need light to germinate. It really depends on what you're growing. So like I said, make sure you check, you're uh, checking out that packet. Once again, I'm gonna bring up Lysianthus. They do need light to germinate, whereas these don't. Um, some, I don't, um, you know, they, they need it a little darker. Some things like, um, um, so like milkweed, if you're saving those seeds, if you want them to germinate, what you're going to want to do is stick those seeds in the freezer um, over the winter because they'll need, um, they'll need uh, that, you know, that time of cold um, before they'll be able to uh, germinate. Um, yeah, and like certain certain other plants, they need what's called scarification, scarification, um, where you'd actually take like sandpaper uh, and uh, um, kind of rub it against the seed in order to get it to germinate. But most garden seeds, you don't need to worry about that. Um, most are pretty easy. And like I said, read the packet um, because it'll tell you. And if you save seeds, from say like wildflowers or something, you know, check it out online from a reputable source. Um, and Beth mentioned um, Johnny Seed, that's really good. They've got a lot of how-to videos. Um, I would definitely recommend checking those out um, if you're interested in that type of thing. Okay, so we filled up our tray right up to the top with our uh, growing meat and we've covered it. Next thing we're, we're gonna do is we're going to wanna label it. So if you wanna take a piece of tape uh, you can put like, uh, what's it called, like scotch tape, and you can um, put that across there after you've labeled it. Or um, what I do is I use just little labels and um, make sure that you put the type of plant that you have. So I'm just using a Sharpie and some little cheap plastic labels. Uh, and this is a red acre cabbage. So at the top, I put cabbage and then I put red acre underneath it, kind of like that. And then that will tell me for the whole um, bunch that that's what I'm, I'm growing right here. I'm gonna actually park it right towards uh, the, the back here. And then your humidity dome, I put this on until they start germinating. After they, they've popped up, um, then um, out of the ground, after you see the little seedlings coming up, um, then I'll actually slowly remove the top. Like I'll crack the um, humidity dome a little bit, kind of like you can see, so it, it gets less humidity for a little bit. It lets a lot of the air escape. And then um, by the end of the day, I'll just take the whole thing off. And then, um, yeah, once they've germinated, while you're waiting for them to germinate, what you'll want to do is you'll want to put a little bit of water across them. Give them a little bit of a drink. Now you don't want to drown them. Uh, you don't want a whole bunch of water, uh, you know, um, coming all the way to the top. But you might want just a little bit of water at the bottom of the tray to maintain humidity. So. You've got that, you put on your humidity dome and you're set. And you can check this every you know, few days 
uh, and uh, they'll they'll come up. And uh, once they come up, and uh, they're they're growing a little bit bigger, then you're going to want to consider uh, transplanting them because those are awfully small cells. And um, what they're going to get is called uh, root bound or pot bound if they're stuck inside those teeny tiny little cells for too long. In order for the plant to keep growing, it needs some space, it needs more nutrition, it needs all of that. And so what we're going to want to do is give some more plants that opportunity. So uh, the next thing you would want to do is, and I'm using a different plant for that. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, when they have, uh, once your plants have germinated and they start to grow, you'll want to get them in um, an area with plenty of light. So to help out with that, you can see right over here, um, I have a grow light. You want to make sure that your grow light is six inches or higher above the plant because you don't want to like burn them. Um, your plants will start turning purple if they get too much light. Um, so that's like, oh my gosh, I'm super stressed. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting way too much light. Or <laughs> plants also will turn like the purplish red also if they are uh, too dry as well. So if plants are stressed, you'll see them start turning colors like that. Um, but what we have is an LED grow light here. And you'll want to make sure that it says like plant grow light uh, for, for this because they are focused specifically on the red and the blue wavelengths. Um, and that's those are the two wavelengths that the plants grow with best. Um, and so um, I'm just going to take these out of here. And we actually have some California Wonder Peppers here. Aaron, see them? It's yeah. uh, it's like eleven forty or excuse me, twelve forty three. Just okay. Thanks. We'll go more. fast with this. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, you've your plants have grown, you know, and uh, you're wondering when do I transplant them? Certain um, I've seen different sources say different things. It really depends um, on you know. Uh, what you're reading. But what I have found that works for me as a general rule is to look at the bottoms. Uh, we water from the bottom and when you'll see, uh, and that draws down the roots. Uh, and so then they'll go right down. And so then when you see the roots coming out the bottom, that's when you know it's time for them to get uh, transplanted. You might be able to see these little roots uh, down here. And so then what you'll do is you can use, it depends on your type of cell, but I use, um, I'm using just a little piece of grape, little chunk of grape vine here. And you just pinch the cell a little bit and you'll pop this, the little seedlings out. And there you go. And then what you'll do is you'll bring it over here to your workstation, take a pot, Fill it about three quarters away full. And then here's a little additional thing that we do here. Uh, we'll take um, some of that hydrogel crystals, some hydrogel crystals. Um, they look kind of like this. And also some mycorrhizal fungi they can get from like MycoGrow. Um, a lot of sources sell it now, but it's like a powder. And put a tablespoon of the hydrogel into some water, and then also about a teaspoon of the um, mycorrhizal fungi, and let it hydrate. And you end up with this, these hydrogel crystals here, and they'll help your plant transplant without as much, you know, very much of a shock to their system. So you'll put about a quarter of a cup into the, um, the pot, and then you'll put your little transplant, your little seedling in there. And then you can go ahead and cover, and you can see it in there, and you can go ahead and cover around the side of, fill in your pot with some growing medium, 
Now, this is the regular growing medium. Around until your little seedling has all of its root cut roots covered and up to you know just underneath um, their leaves, and you're good to go. Um, put it back under the light until you're ready to transplant it out to the ground, um, out into the garden or another pot if you want to you know do patio planting. And uh, when you transplant out, it's the same process except for you do it in the soil with sun uh, or excuse me with some tomatoes. I also put in a handful of crushed um, crushed eggshells underneath the tomatoes to prevent blossom end rot uh, for that calcium. And then you just plant like up till their first leaf and then also maybe take off that first leaf to prevent fungal issues. Um, and and uh, yeah, that's how you start your plants inside. Uh, that's just kind of a little rough overview. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So I'll yeah. start here at the top. Give me a minute. Okay. Beer to kill slugs. Uh, we've yeah. got about six questions. Um, do you put it in the soil or does the slug climb into the container? Slug climbs into the container. And essentially it's kind of like, you know, if you drink pop or other carbonated things, um, uh, slugs can't burp. So you get a, a buildup of uh, like that, um, like carbon dioxide type stuff, whatever, the bubbles. And yeah, so that's how it kills them. So they're the opposite <laughs> of the big friendly giant. Um, exactly. <laughs> at, okay, question. At, uh, what is the outside temperature you're able to transplant some of your seedlings to the outside soil? That's a really good question. And I would look online. Um, there are cheat sheets online. It'll tell you exactly which plants need what temperature. Okay, I'll try and find a link for that. Um, do grow lights stay on 24 hours a day? And thinking of starting out very slowly, do you have to have a grow light? Can you just use a window? Um, you can use a window. Um, make sure that your, uh, your plants are fit. Your window is a south facing window. Um, that will give you optimal light. You'll see that in our greenhouse, some of our plants are on the very top shelf and they don't have grow lights on them. Um, they might get a little more called leggy, which means that their um, cells, like the plant wants more light. So it'll like stretch its cells um, and it'll get this, each of the cells will be a little weaker, um, but they're, they're like trying to get towards the light. And uh, so they might get what's called leggy. So they'll be, they'll look longer and skinnier um, if, if, it, if they don't have as much light as they want. Um, but yeah, you, you know, you can definitely do that. Like you can see that we have that, um, for like a South facing window. I wouldn't mess with it with like North face window, East and West. Um, they might need a little bit more assistance as well with some grow light, but yeah, you can in a self facing window. I know that for sure. Cause that's what we've got here. Okay. Yeah. And it, was there a second part to that? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, we don't necessarily need a light. Um, I'm trying to find a better resource on when to kind of put plants outside. Yeah. Um, that was another question. Uh, do, does compost soil need fertilizer? And second question, does your outside garden have automatic watering system? Outside gar uh, garden does, um, we do not have an automatic watering system. We will um, turn on um, our sprinklers and uh, we'll move the sprinklers from section to section. Um, that's how we do that for outside. Um, but then um, the first part was compost. So uh, I would test your soil first to see um, where you're at exactly. And then um, with your compost, uh, make sure number one, you're using only the specific you know, correct compost, you know, that you're not using any meat, dairy, anything like that um, in your compost. Um, but, um, you know, county extension might be a better, uh, might be a better resource for answering that one. Um, thank you. Now, if we want to start with plants instead of seeds, when should we place plants outside? Okay, you know, so most couple. plants can be, um, Mother's Day weekend is usually a good time to plant most of your plants, um, like most of your garden plants. Um, 
you can plant potatoes, onions, and like uh, some of your cold, um, colder crops um, earlier that are more um, resistant, like uh, they can handle a frost or two, like spinach or lettuce. You could plant those now outside if you wanted to. Um, but you don't want to, you do risk possibly having them rot. Uh, if like potatoes rotting, if you plant them too early. But usually uh, Mother's Day weekend is after our last uh, possible frost date. Um, and then that'll be everything, you know, that's where, that's when we transplant out our garden crops with the exception of um, our tender uh, crops, like peppers, tomatoes, sweet potatoes. Those are the last week in uh, May or the first week in June because they really can't handle any cold. <laughs> and if you're concerned about that, there's something called like a wall of water or um, which is basically a covering on the outside that um, helps your plants like um, from getting, um, you know, it, it, it kind of buffers the, the, um, the outside temperature. Uh, for your like tomatoes and peppers and stuff like that. Um, also, some people use um, milk jugs with the lids off. Um, they kind of work as little um, greenhouses as well. But um, with those, yeah, yes, you can start things early, but the issue is uh, you gotta be vigilant. You gotta take the lids off of your curtain, um, your milk jugs and stuff so you don't cook them out. Sometimes, like last week, we had, you know, the really warm temperatures and we can get, you know, really warm temperatures, you know, in, um, you know, after you've got your plants outside um, and you could end up cooking your plants too. So that's also an issue. Um, another thing to consider is when you're bringing your plants out, uh, make sure that you transition slowly. It's called hardening off your plants. So give them about a week of time uh, to transition from the inside temperatures to the outside temperatures. So um, what you'll do is start with like an hour, take your plants outside for like an hour outside, and bring them back in. And then you can keep adding more time outside. Another thing that I do is I also put up like plastic um, around the outside to kind of keep the wind off of them. And so then they'll start getting acclimated slowly to the because it's sunnier outside, it's windier outside, and also they're dealing with different temperatures out there. So slowly bring your plants outside. Um, we'll do a couple more and then we might have to pause to be respectful of everyone's time and then we can come back. Uh, so we have a friend that lives in California. Lucky oh, too. cool. Um, she's bought uh, plastic raised garden boxes, but can she yep. start seedlings outside in this because there's no issue of frost? Um, yes, uh, I would make sure that as long as the temperature, sometimes it'll say like right on your packet or you can look online uh, what temperature, um, you know, uh, they need to germinate because um, seeds won't germinate under a certain temperature, say like, you know, like 55 degrees or, you know, 65 degrees ish. Um, those are pretty base temperatures. Um, some plants just won't germinate under, uh, they won't start growing from the seeds under that temperature. So as long as her seeds are at least that warm, uh, they should be good. Also, <laughs> it can't get too hot either. So um, plants, you know, make sure it's not too warm too. Um, I don't know how hot it gets where she lives in California, but as long as, you know, it's not like 100 degrees trying to germinate lettuce or spinach or something like that, you should be, you know, check, check online, um, make sure that you're uh, looking at the germination temperatures, Great. usually like, a, like 65 to 80, uh, 75, 65 to 75 are, are good temperatures. Um, we'll do one more and then I'll have Rose wrap us up and then we can come back to more questions because these are really good. Um, last question for now. Do the eggshells go in the soil with the tomato plant? Okay, so what you'll do is, um, and okay, so, and I have a slide. I don't know if we want to bring that up or not. Um, on the slideshow, well, I'll just tell you right off the bat. So I dig the, a deep hole 
so that it'll cover like it so that say here's the bottom of the hole and you, you'd be able to put the whole you know the tomato in and it would hit the first leaf at the um like at the ground level and yes that's the one thanks beth and so then what i do is i'll put some mycorrhizal uh or the eggshells at the very bottom right at the bottom of the hole and then we'll put some of that um, mycorrhizal gel um mycorrhizal fungi mixed in with that hydrogel in there and then we'll plant in the seed or the seed the tomato sorry um, so that you can see right there, it, it goes right up to just about the first leaf. And then um, the next, um, the next uh, uh, picture there shows just putting a tomato cage around that. Um, but I would um, use your fingers and pinch off for a scissors and, uh, you know, and cut off that bottom leaf there though before um, you move on. And then also put some um, like uh, straw um, underneath it uh, to prevent, you know, fungal issues. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, we'll and you can do a whole handful, by the way, like how much uh, I do about a handful. Sorry. Oh, that's good. Um, we'll come back. There's a few more questions, but just for those of our friends that do have the hour to spend with us. Thank you. Thank you. So Rose, I'll pull up our final piece here. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Karen, we're grateful for the time and energy in putting this program together for us today. And thank you and your friends for sharing their work and their reflections. You can find a recording of this program at fspa.org slash ecoaction in the coming days. And all of the previous recordings are found there as well. The next Eco Spirituality in Action Lunch and Learn program is the second Tuesday in May, starting at noon. The title is The Glory of Birds, with information from experts about migratory birds as May is American Wetland Month. What can we see out our own windows? For the closing prayer, uh, I just want to give a little bit of credit to M. Scott Mamaday, who has a new book called Earth Keepers. Um, he calls it like his spiritual autobiography. And so some of the images that I use in this, as I wrote this prayer, are, are from his book. So let us be in prayer as we close today. Creator God, for the gifts of land and soil, for sun and rain, for seeds to plant that bear vegetables and fruit to nourish our bodies, we give you thanks. O Holy One, you call us to be keepers of your earth for it is essential to our being. As we take in our hands the tiniest of seeds and place them in the richness of soil, as we smell the rain-soaked earth, as we smell the wonder of spring's flowering trees and touch the flower's pollen, as we eat of the fruits of our co-laboring, we remember that we are of the earth, your earth. You invite us, O oh God, to revere this holy ground of yours, for in the earth is our well-being. And as we treat it with kindness, the earth will treat us kindly. And so we pray, O oh God, for wisdom to be kind and gentle keepers of your earth, for the good of all your creatures. In the name of the Holy Trinity, amen. That was beautiful, Rose, thank you. And um, thank you all for coming. We will we'll touch back with Karen. If you're able to stay with us, we can stay on for a few minutes. Um, let's see, where were we in the list of questions? <laughs> okay, if I miss something, someone raise your hand so I can call on you. But Karen, are you with us?
Yeah, can I quick add, I forgot to say um, how long the light should be on. It should be 14 to 16 hours. I just remembered that during the, uh, at the end there. Sorry about that. And that was the question about the, the grow light. Grow light. Yep. They should have 14 to 16 hours of light. Great. Thank you. Um, good. Okay. Very specific now to the FSPA land garden or garden on the land. Um, do you have a fence around your garden so that deer or other animals don't get at the plants? Really great question. So what we do is we do, uh, we grow sunflowers around the perimeter of our gardens and that kind of works um, as part of the deer fence, but then also we put up our trellises, you know, if you're, you're going to need a trellis anyway for growing, say, like your beans and your peas. And so we place the trellised rows also in, um, you know, intermittently throughout the rows, throughout the garden as well, so that it, the deer kind of almost like feel that they're being corralled and they do not like that feeling. And that keeps out a lot of our deer, not all of them, but um, it does a pretty good job. It's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. All right, um, next question. Are there certain vegetables that do not grow well in container gardens? Um, okay, so you can grow a lot in container gardens, but the depth of the container is very important. So like if we, uh, we can talk about container gardens more and I'd love to, but um, make sure that, so like for lettuce, you're not dealing with a root crop at all. Um, you know, your the roots are, um, you know, they go out, you know, they're fibrous and, you know, they, they don't go too deep. So for a lettuce, you're not going to have an issue. It should be, you know, you could have like a six, six inch um, raised bed, just a teeny tiny little one. So if you are working with like little, little kids and you just want to show them, you know, the very basics or something like that, um, you know, that'll work just fine. Spinach, lettuce, that. Um, but when you're talking about, say, um, carrots or, um, you know, maybe even like, you know, beets, potatoes, any of that, that six inch garden isn't gonna be nearly enough. You're gonna need to get it a lot deeper. So you might see like those five gallon pails. Um, it looks almost like a five gallon pail. You can grow some root crops in that, uh, but you need that depth and you need it to be um, uh, like the soil, uh, the growing medium that you're growing it in needs to be um, well aerated, well drained, and um, it needs to be, you know, be able to retain some humidity too, but it needs to be easy for the roots to get through. It needs to be easy for those plants to be able to create um, their tubers, you know, um, or their modified roots. Um, so you can grow a lot now in a lot of the options, but it needs to be a pretty darn deep pot. So like um, also another thing to consider is like trellising. So for your tomatoes, um, you need to have a really, you know, a pretty sizable pot, like, you know, this big of a pot for a, for a tomato, along with like a big stake in the middle, you know, tomato cage, something like that. You see those um, and make sure also that your plants are determinate. Um, so like a determinate tomato, which means that they kind of set fruit at the same time and um, they only grow to a certain height uh, and then they'll stop growing higher. Um, so for example, like I said, determinate tomatoes. Um, if you get an indeterminate tomato, it's going to want to keep growing. And um, that is something that you do not want to be growing in say like a small pot like this. Um, make sure that you're growing, it'll even say like patio tomato, um, something like that. That's what you're looking for for um, container gardening. Um, but I have seen like in some raised beds uh, in the square, you know, uh, like square foot gardening, you know, that was really hip a few years ago. Again, it came back, it was like really hip in what, the 80s, and then it came back just a few years ago. And um, you'll see, you know, trellises in there. Um, and, and those are not, you know, well, there are different heights, but so a lot of them are pretty shallow. So um, that's just something to consider, um, you know, depending on the depth, 
root crops aren't necessarily always the best option and also things that need to be trellis. They, they also, um, don't do as well, um, in pots. You can also find like bush cucumbers, bush beans, that type of a thing. Good. Gosh, you're just a wealth of knowledge. I think everybody wants to just Jeez. take you with them. <laughs> I wish I knew more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can you talk specifically again about the mycorrhizal fungi and the dipping gels? Just maybe some names that you use. There's no endorsements, but just what you use. Yeah, we are not supported by. Um, so I'll just be honest. Um, okay, so we just got a giant bag off of, um, you can get it at Walmart, you can get it at like on Amazon, you know, here I am endorsing these people, right? Um, but uh, I'm not gonna lie, I got mine on Amazon, the mycorrhizal crystals. You can get this hydrogel in super small crystals, very finely grained, uh, or the larger ones that I've got here. I like the larger ones personally, and here's why. It's because they don't stick together as much. Like when you, here, I'll make up a batch. Can I quick make up a batch? Is that okay? Do we have enough time for that? I'll go quick. Sure, go quick. Okay, um, I'll dump mine and I'll start over. So one of the things I'm trying to find to help with everyone, um, in addition to the containers that we talked about, or she just talked about for growing, there are some plants that grow well together and it's called companion planting. Um, I'll try and find a basic link about that. For example, you do not want to plant green beans with basil. They are not companions, but you want to plant carrots with tomatoes. Um, there's a whole list of plants and seedlings that go well together. So if you're trying to maximize space in a container, um, you can look at a companion planting chart. And if you have more space in your backyard, even better, you can do multiple, multiple layers. So Karen, turn your, turn your camera down a little bit because I don't think we can see. There we go. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So um, I just filled up one, you know, a gallon <laughs> nature's touch pale, you know, we reuse a lot of things here. Um, so I've just got some measuring spoons here and I'm going to grab a tablespoon of the hydrogel for this gallon. So about a tablespoon and then I sprinkle it around so it doesn't clump. Minimize that. And you really need to be vigilant about that with the smaller crystals and making sure you have that lid on because otherwise you're gonna have an issue. Okay, and then with all, with the um, Myco, Myco Grow, you can't see it very well because this is well loved, I'll say, um, but this is called Myco Grow, M-Y-C-O and then G-R-O-W. And this is from Fungi Perfecti. I think that they're out of Washington State. We order through them. And um, I've got just a five pound um, container here um, package. And this, we use this all last year. Um, and this should get us at least through this year as well. So I just put that inside of <laughs> this um, tin thing that I got at Goodwill. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, and then just press it down. And I do keep little scoopers inside of there too. Um, and so then, oh, I didn't actually put any in. Got sidetracked talking about it, sorry. So yeah, I just take the teaspoon and it doesn't need to be perfect, you know, just shake it off a little bit. And then this is what it looks like. It's a powder and um, and this will promote root growth. And so I just kind of sprinkle that in there. And this is specific for vegetables, flowers, and fruit trees. If you um, go on their website, there's, there are quite a few options there. And uh, that's what that's all about. And then the gel itself, you can... Um, if you could put your hand in here right now, you'd feel that it's already starting to soften, but it takes at least 15 minutes to fully 
um, you know, fully uh, gel out, I guess, hydrate would probably be a better word for it. And so you just wait about 15 minutes and then it'll look Kind of like this, where you actually get the crystals. And I'll just park that in here because it's okay. We're not worried about cross contamination. Um, yeah. And so then uh, every time that we transplant something, we put in, uh, you know, we put this uh, just underneath the roots, and that will minimize the shock for our plants when they transplant. Because every time you transplant, oops, oh, every time you transplant something, they will lose some roots um, just because it's, you know, transplant shock. It's just what it is. Um, this will help minimize this and the hydrogel will kind of buffer humidity to their roots as well, which is kind of nice. Um, so when we transplant them out in the garden, we'll also um, uh, do the hydrogel mixture for that as well. And that's how you make it. It's easy. If I can do it, you can do it. Okay, I put the link for the micro grow in the chat box. Um, and we'll try and do our best to have all this information afterwards on the eco action site. Um, so I wrote down mycorrhizal fungi, dipping gel, water storing crystals or hydro gel, link to the micro grow. I think we've got it covered now. Um, we have a question about how do you keep squirrels from eating the plants or flowers? I have yeah. a question. I haven't really had that much of an issue. And I think that a lot of it is because, you know, our woods is a, quite a ways away. We've got um, woods quite a ways away. And then we've got a whole um, field um, that is in usually hay or corn, um, you know, in between us and the woods. So we really, to my knowledge, I haven't really had issues with squirrels. So I, I can't, yeah, Beth, you might, you might so, be able to share. You live, yeah. I, I live in the city of La Crosse and squirrels are a nuisance. And when I plant my seeds directly in the ground or in a container, I literally put old window screens over my garden bed or um, a very kind of loose, uh, like, potato bag that still has the airflow just for a couple days until that soil has settled or been rained on because it's when squirrels, I think they can smell, I don't know for sure. I think they can smell fresh dug soil. So they're attracted to it. So I cover it up with a uh, window screen and that seems to work pretty well. All right, um, I think we are, I think we're at the end, Karen. Uh, Thank you. We're going to put, put information and tips as part of the website and this recording. And yeah, thank you. Love talking plants. I like the excuse. <laughs> All right. Well, thank we're you. We're always looking for, for volunteers us. too. Sorry, Beth. No, you're good. You're good. Volunteer. Thank you. Nice job, Karen. Beth. Thanks, thank Karen. you. Very nice. Really good. Thanks. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks. You rock, Vicky. <laughs> you rock. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks bye. again, bye -bye. Vicky. Thanks, Karen. Thank, Thank you. you.